Hey, hi there. Welcome to Grocket and uh, the ACT science lesson where we'll be going through uh, the stuff you need to know for the test to be able to do well, uh, strategies you can use to do well even if science is not your strong point, and um, <clears throat> techniques that will work throughout the entire test as well. We'll give you an overview of what that section involves and then get into the actual content areas and passage types that you can expect to see. My name is Jim Jacobson and um, I I don't know if you want to hear that much about me. I think you'd probably rather hear about uh, ACT science. So how about we do that? So, um, <clears throat> so the first part is the introduction and overview. Um, the course schedule today, we're going to talk about that overview. There is actually some content on um, some topic areas uh, as well as some overall strategies. Then in the remaining sessions, we'll be covering each of the remaining each of the passage types that you can expect to see on the ACT science section. But first, there's that necessary background. And keep in mind, there is homework at the end of every Grocket lesson, and you can expect, or hope, or whatever, uh, you, can, you can use the homework that we give you at the end. It's tagged according to the topics that we talk about in each of these lessons. So if there's something that you hear today that you want to do more of, either because you like it or you want to practice it more, you will have the ability to do that uh, additional work later. So, topics it covered in ACT Science. Um, so there's, that, that's, that, that's this lesson, not the topic, not the test itself. Uh, we'll cover the overview of the test, the scoring, what to expect, and then we'll talk about biology and the physical sciences. So first let's talk about that overview, the format. So it's always the fourth test on the ACT. Maybe they save the best for last, maybe they want to hit you when you're down. Depending on how much you like science, that probably affects how you view it. 35 questions in 40 minutes is, um, it's not a lot of time, um, considering the depth of detail. Uh, the good news is, actually, that you don't actually have to be a science whiz or memorize the information. It's more about what you can figure out from what they give you. So, uh, in some cases, it requires even less than a minute for a question because um, it's relatively straightforward if you know where to look. Three main passage types, well, only three passage types, re research summaries, data representation, and conflicting viewpoints. So we'll cover each of those in the lessons after this one. I mean, we'll still see passages like this, but we'll cover those specific types, the ins and outs of each of them next time. Uh, and then four, t four content areas, biology, physical sciences, chemistry, and physics. So uh, you can expect to see a mix of all of these, and you're not expected to have taken coursework in these. Of course, you will have taken coursework in some of them, but it's not required, and you don't have to remember it necessarily. You, you need to be paying attention, though, on the passages. Basic strategies for ACT science. Um, again, even if you're bad at science, you can still do well and uh, should expect that you'll be able to do well if you're following along and paying attention. You don't have to be a science whiz. Strategy one, and we're gonna go over these in more depth. Always guess on every question. Um, use your pencil to mark up the, the passage. You get a booklet and you get a pencil. You may as well use them. Uh, Mark off key words, trends in the graphs, anything that you need to do to make it easier to interpret the information you're given, because you are given a fair amount of it. Um, find support in the passage, so you can expect that they're not going to ask you about your outside knowledge. They're going to be asking you about things they just told you, so it's in there. And then don't be confused by complex vocabulary. Nobody's going to ask you on your way out how to spell whatever it was, you know. Okay, so first off, the strategy number one, always guess. I mean, you know, if you know the answer, go ahead and put in the real answer, but don't leave any blank. Um, there is likely to be at least one difficult question per passage, so you can just plan on at least one maybe not being too difficult. Don't panic if none of them seem difficult. Maybe you're just smart or lucky and you see the answer. It doesn't matter, but if you see one that's difficult, don't freak out. The important thing about this, then, is that because you have only about a minute for a question, a little bit over, um, don't reread the entire passage, which is kind of long, for one question. Just pick one that seems likely and then move on. If you have time later, you can come back. So it's better to guess than to spend more than a minute, um, because that's time taken away from questions that are easier, quite frankly. Um, and since the questions don't necessarily get harder as you go, you may as well do that. So go ahead, bubble in the question, you know, mark it into the bubble uh, before you move on so that you have something there so that if you do run out of time, an answer's in there and you could get it right. If you don't mark something down at all, you can't get it right. So, you know, 0% of the questions you don't try to answer will be right. 
okay? All right, so strategy two, use your pencil, okay? You can use it for more than just like poking your cheek or drawing little doodles. You can use it to mark up the graphs and the passages and highlight the information that's important. So you may be required to do some arithmetic. Your scratch paper will help with that. And your calculator is not allowed on this section. So um, do be prepared to do some basic arithmetic. Um, circle what the question is really asking. Maybe that seems self-explanatory, but uh, I don't know how many times even I've done that where I, I go through all the trouble of answering a question and then I find out later I was asking or I was answering a question other than the one that they were actually asking, something related, but not actually what they asked. Make sure you do what they ask you to. You can't get it right if you don't. Uh, lines on the graphs can always be extended, so they may, be ask, they, may, they may ask you to extrapolate from the information that you're given in the passage or in a graph. Just draw the line a little further and you'll get an idea of where things are going. And then mark up the passages in a way that makes sense to you. So what I do today may work for you, you know, in, in terms of the ways that I mark things up. It may not. If not, don't do that, okay? Uh, do things that make sense if you would rather underline or you would rather write down uh, keywords on the side as long as they're not too long, circling, underlining, dashes, I don't care, boxes, you know. Do what works for you to keep the information straight in your head and on paper. So find support. Um, the information, everything you need to answer the questions is in the passage. They don't ask you about your outside science knowledge. If you have outside knowledge, it helps, but you don't need it at all. You just need to be able to read the stuff. So <clears throat> don't try to memorize the information from the passage. It's there for you. So treat this like an open book test. You don't remember which of the two types of beans or something. You know, oh, there were two types of beans, and I don't remember which one was the kind they were asking about. Just go look. Look in the passage, okay? So uh, you don't need to have it in your head. Uh, think first. Uh, the answer choices won't add to your understanding. That's, uh, that's not necessarily true of all sections of the test. The answer choices can help you in the math section, but on the science section, it's going the answers uh, or information about the answers um, come, or about the questions comes from the passage, not the answer choices. They will only confuse you. And then, you know, match, match keywords. They can't just call something by a different name. Scientific names are, are very specific and unique to each individual concept or item or whatever. So um, match up the words and that can sometimes help you find the section of the passage or graph that you need. Okay, and so don't let the vocabulary confuse you. <clears throat> it's the science passage and you have not been st studying science for your entire life. Uh, basically, you can expect to see some unknown words, okay? Uh, some of them will be, you know, diseases or body parts or scientific terms. Uh, don't let that worry you. That's going to happen. Focus on the main idea and get a rough idea of what those terms are without worrying about those words themselves. Don't waste time trying to guess how they're pronounced. Of course, I have to try to guess how they're pronounced because I'm talking to you right now. But on the test, it's silent. You're doing it for yourself. Don't worry about how it's pronounced and whether it matches a word that you heard in class. The information is there in the passage. And then you can, of course, replace confusing or long words, especially ones that have been defined for you, uh, with something else, whether it's, you know, so you can have a growlis vanille um, that you can just call blah blah, or pepperoni pizza, or, or hippopotamus, or whatever you want to call it, um, as long as it's distinct from other terms in the passage and doesn't, you know, confuse things. Um, and if there's some term that they've defined for you that you've paraphrased in some other way, like, oh, that's the thing that increases, you know, uh, use whatever paraphrase that you can and to make it easier to understand. Don't get bogged down in the words. And then the numbers are more important than words because that's where they, they can't make you do arithmetic with words. They can't put words on a graph aside from the axes. Okay, so the numbers are more important because you're, gonna, you're going to be asked about whether those things are going up or down a lot of the time. Are the numbers going up or down? Pay attention to that. So the scientific method is uh, the foundation, of course, of the entire science section. Science section is important because, of course, many people major in science things in college and they want you to understand that. Scientific method, then, um, it helps if you have a basic understanding of it because a lot of these things are experimentally related. Um, that is to say, the passages are, a lot of times, the information that has been gathered as part of an experiment or used to support a, hypo a hypothesis. So, um, Familiarity with the scientific method can help you a lot. Understanding how scientists think will make the passages make more sense. So this is the process by which scientists basically do their work. So they first, um, they observe um, phenomena in the world, natural world, 
um, and, um, and they measure them, okay? From that measurement, they will draw some hypothesis. They'll make a hypothesis, uh, a hypothesis uh, about how things are working. Here's an explanation of, you know, the stuff that we just saw that happened. Here, here's my idea for why that might have happened. They then, step three, make a prediction about um, why that might be, or hey, if, we, if that's true, if my idea is true, then if we do this other thing, then this should be the result of that too. After they make that prediction, of course, they back it up by actually doing an experiment to see whether that's true. They may, in fact, do a series of experiments, um, modifying their hypotheses as they go, and uh, refining it to the point where it becomes um, uh, much more thorough and complete and uh, accurate. And when, if enough of experiments back something up, something may actually become a theory or a quote-unquote law of nature. Um, but that's not necessarily the point. Uh, if the hypothesis turns out to be wrong, that's actually equally valuable in science, or almost equally valuable. Sometimes it's actually better to figure out why things are happening, but if you can r rule out a reason, that's part of how science works. It's a big part of how science works. A lot of stuff not working. Anyway, um, this understanding will help you on test day because all of these things are scientific. Scoring basics, and so this is kind of important because this affects the strategy that we're telling you for the ACT science section. So, um, unlike the other three subject tests, you only get one score. You may, you may recall, if you've watched the other videos or done other reading on the ACT, that you get some subscores. Uh, subscores are reported to schools so that they have an idea of how well you did on certain types of things. The science section has only one score. They don't differentiate by how, you know, how well you did on the biology stuff or how well you did on differing viewpoint passages. They just give you the overall score. Uh, it's a score from 1 to 36, and uh, it's averaged in with your other scores for your ACT composite, which is the big number that usually when people are asking you or telling you about ACT, they're talking about that big number, the composite score. The individual scar scores are, of course, reported to schools, and so if they notice one is exceptionally high or low, that may make a difference, but the composite one's the big one. Uh, so here's a sample scoring chart. This is different every year because it's different, you know, according to what the actual results are of who takes the test. But this gives you an idea of how your science score can actually impact your overall score. So let's just pretend that you just totally guess. You hate science and you freeze up and so you decide to just guess on every single question on the section. Statistically, you should still get one in four right um, because, you know, four answer choices. If you guess at random, statistically, you should be right one in four times. So one in four times, you'll notice um, here, that should be 10 out of 40 questions. So that alone will get you that scale score of 14. If you can do better than that, if there's a few questions that look easy enough that you feel good trying them, and you can get some of those right, let's say you get another 10 right just from thinking and then you guess on the rest so you guess on guess on 30 and get 10 right your scaled score goes up to a 19 and um, if you can get three quarters of them right again you don't have to get all of them right if you can get three quarters of them right and just guess on the ones that are hard and annoying and you can't figure them out you can that's a scaled score of 25 which is um, which is much better and um, in keeping with with a good score again it gets averaged in with the other ones so um, uh, it's a getting a decent science score is key to having a good overall ACT score. <clears throat> so the ideal pa the ideal pacing is five minutes per passage, and there are seven passages. Remember, you have thirty five minutes. So five minutes per passage is not that much time, and since they're not arranged in order of difficulty, you can't expect to necessarily breeze through those beginning questions and then move on to tougher ones, or do the tough ones first and then breeze through the easy ones. So um, <clears throat> it's more up to you to pace yourself accordingly, and when you start to hit a, a snag, guess and move on. Um, right, so the questions aren't in order of difficulty, nor are the passages. Nothing's in order of difficulty. It's up to you to judge whether it's too difficult for you and whether you should be moving on. Uh, you can do them in any order, but since they don't increase or decrease in order, um, it doesn't matter that much. I mean, uh, probably though, um, a strategy might make sense to choose passages uh, first 
uh, that you are somewhat familiar with the topic because you have an increased chance of understanding the passage well and, and recognizing crazy answers, um, for example, something that isn't appropriate based on your own knowledge. So, uh, you know, if you just like the look of one of the questions, go ahead and do that one first. Just make sure you do all of them, or at least answer all of them. You don't have to do all of them. And then seven passages total. Seven passages at five minutes per passage is pretty tough. So uh, in terms of what to expect, so this is that, that same section, remember that grid that we just had up on the screen? This is that same thing, just the science. So here we're comparing two different uh, people who took their ACT and did different things on the science passage. So Joy, she did seven passages in 35 minutes. So that's what you're supposed to do. Um, she spent that five minutes per passage. She missed two to four questions per passage. So she didn't do that well on each of them. And so she uh, got a raw score of 20 out of 40, so she got half of her questions right. <clears throat> so uh, Joy is sitting here at, at a 19 or so. Um, so her scale, or, you know, so that's, that's good. I mean, it's certainly better than if she had left things blank. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, then we have Kara. So Kara didn't actually bother doing all the questions. She answered them, but she didn't really only try. She, uh, she didn't really try two of them. She just totally guessed on the last two passages. So she did five passages in 35 minutes, which gave her seven minutes per passage. Um, again, which is about, uh, you know, since you're going at about a minute per question, that gave her a lot more time. Um, basically two more minutes. Um, Per question. So she got three questions on the right, uh, in, uh, three questions um, on the final two passages by just by guessing. Statistically, that's likely to happen. You can get more, you can get less, but that's the average. And her raw score comes out to be 25 by getting the additional um, 10 right, or the excuse me, the additional five right. Her score, her scaled score went up by six. So um, the science section is much more susceptible to kind of a strategy of. Um, taking control, doing the things that you know, um, focusing on questions that you have a chance to get right, uh, and then, you know, not worrying about the ones that you can't. Just, you know, say, I, I hate you, hard question. I guess on you, and then you move on. Yeah, so Kara end up with a 22. Sorry. That, I pointed that out already, but... Um, oh, sorry, I pointed at 25. She got a 22 by getting five more right. She's actually right there. Anyway, sorry about that. You get the idea. She, she got um, three more by doing less work. Not bad. So biology is one of the uh, sort of overarching subject areas that you will end up seeing on the ACT. Uh, so, and these passages may deal with some of these um, ideas. So body systems, cellular biology, photosynthesis, ecosystems, evolution, and genetics. Just note how widely ranging these biological science topics are. You may have covered some of these in school already. In fact, I bet you've covered quite a few of these in school already at one point or another. Not that that's required, but a little familiarity does make this easier. Note that it ranges all the way from really little things. Um, photosynthesis is a pretty small process, cellular biology, really little things. Um, but getting all the way up to ecosystems and evolution, those are really big things. So. Um, it's basically unlikely that you, you'll have spent a lot of time doing all of these biological science topics. So don't expect to. Don't plan on it. Expect to see some new stuff. Um, and if you like biology, maybe you'll see some fun stuff. But um, it'll be a wide variety and you can't predict whether it's stuff you've studied before. So let's talk about a sample passage here. So passage 7. So in the 1940s, um, scientists thought all genetic material was contained in structures called chromosomes and that chromosomes had been found only in the nucleus of a cell, not in the cytoplasm. So sometimes there'll be diagrams too with these. Uh, sometimes those will serve to jog your memory. If it is something that you've studied before, the diagram isn't always needed for the passage, but you know, it's a, it's a science passage and so they're part of it. You know, I don't necessarily recommend doodling on them, but you can, um, as long as you don't interfere with your ability to see the, the drawing if a question asks you about it later. Chromosomes are, tip, are composed of two types of molecules. So note that uh, we've heard about chromosomes a bunch of times already. That's likely the topic of the passage. So um, paying extra attention to when that comes up again makes a big difference. So chromosomes are, like, are composed of two types of molecules, proteins and deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. Proteins are composed of subunits called amino acids. 
DNA consists of chains of subunits called nucleotides. Uh, the parts of chromosomes that are responsible for the transmission of genetic information are called genes. So we've had uh, three additional words defined here, um, some of them being parts of proteins, some of them being parts of DNA. We don't have to remember what those terms are, we do need to remember where they were defined, and if it helps, um, what, they, what the difference is. So um, proteins have one type of subunit, DNA has a different type of subunit. Then there we get to the actual passage part of here. Two scientists in the 1940s debate whether genes are made of proteins or DNA. So we note that we have two viewpoints here. This is the differing viewpoints passage type. We'll actually get to that in, in session four. Uh, get to that in terms of an analysis of how you handle this type of thing. But, you know, we're still equipped to read stuff, pay attention, and make some conclusions about sciencey stuff, um, even though we haven't covered that. Anyway. Um, so viewpoint number one, the protein hypothesis. So remember, they have two viewpoints. One is that proteins are the, um, whether genes are proteins, and then the other viewpoint is that genes are DNA. So first, genes are proteins. Genes are made only of proteins. Clearly, that's the thesis statement, and not just because it's got a red box around it, but it comes right out and says genes are made of proteins. Proteins make up 50% or more of a cell's dry weight. Cells contain 20 different amino acids that can be arranged in a virtually infinite number of ways to make different proteins. The number and arrangement of different amino acids within a protein form the codes that contain hereditary information, basically saying they do the same thing as genes, so the argument goes, in the 40s. In contrast, only four different nucleotides make up the DNA found in cells, and they are believed to form chains only in certain ratios. As a result, the number of different combinations that DNA can carry is much smaller than the number that proteins can carry. So that's their conclusion, um, which is Again, the same thing. Genes are it. Um, the genes are proteins, not DNA. Or so says this scientist. Scientist number two, the DNA hypothesis, genes are made only of DNA. Flat out contradiction saying it's DNA. DNA is found exclusively in the cell's nucleus, whereas proteins are found throughout the nucleus and cytoplasm. Additionally, the amount of protein in a cell varies from cell type to cell type, even within the same animal. Though DNA is less abundant than proteins, the amount is consistent from cell type to cell type within the same animal, except for the gametes, the reproductive cells. Gametes have this half the amount of DNA as other cells in the body. Gametes also have half the typical number of chromosomes. Thus, the amount of DNA in a cell is correlated with the number of chromosomes in the cell. No such correlation is found for proteins. So, that's the information that we have. Um, and since it is science writing, the hypothesis usually will be quite upfront and explicit and the evidence that supports it. That's one of the points of science writing is being clear so other people can understand what you're saying. So um, you can expect that to be part of science passages, but you do still need to identify what those conclusions are and keep them straight because in this case, again, we have conflicting viewpoints. So physical sciences, um, just like in biology, keep the focus on analysis. You're not required to know this stuff. You're not required to have taken this stuff or have ever heard of it in your life. You're required to read it and then answer some questions about it based on your understanding of the passage. So uh, physical sciences, non-living things, okay, um, as opposed to biology, which is living things. So, um, you know, geology, seismology, oceanography, the Earth's atmosphere, meteorology, soil science, dirt, and rocks and air yeah I, I mean so and and all the sub things that you can get out of those fields uh, it covers a wide range of things physical sciences and uh, again this is differentiated from physics but um, physical sciences sometimes called earth sciences um, are, these are all earth related things so again you may you may be familiar with them you may not it doesn't matter you can do these questions anyway So here's an example passage of what you might expect to see on physical sciences. So um, geologists describe the orientation of sedimentary rock layers. So here we've got a, a definition here, sedimentary rock layers. You may remember what they are. It doesn't matter. Nobody cares what sedimentary rock layers are unless it defines them for us. So geologists describe the orientation of sedimentary rock layers using two angles, dip and strike. I have a feeling we're about to get some definitions. The dip indicates how far from the horizontal the rock layer is tilted, and the strike indicates the compass direction along which the rock layer has been tilted. So one is a, uh, a measure of how much something is tipped, and then the other is which direction it is. So we have dip and strike defined for us in the first couple lines. For example, oh, we have examples too, so this is great in case we didn't get it the first time. 
Um, a dip of one degree indicates that a rock layer is near, nearly horizontal. It slopes downward at an angle of only one degree. Pretty easy. And again, we have to pay attention to those numbers. One degree of, one, one degree of dip um, is a uh, downward, um, downward angle of one degree. So one equals one. That's an important ratio, and it's possible that it could have been a scale that two degrees of dip is, uh, is one degree of whatever, of actual measure. You know, it's not in this case, but we need to pay attention to that. A strike of one degree indicates that the rock layer is tilted along a line running one degree east of north, i.e. almost due north. So again, it's a one-to-one -one correspondence, um, and a strike of 90 degrees indicates that the rock layer is tilted along a line running 90 degrees east of north. That is to say, due east, and so forth. Within a mountain range, strike values are typically similar. This might be helpful to know later. Um, for instance, a map, and again, for instance, is a, spe is a specific example that's going to tell us more about it. it. It's probably not as key a part of the definition if we understood it the first time. A map will show that the Allegheny Mountains run from southwest to northeast, and the strikes of rock layers within this area are often approximately the same, a value of approximately 45 degrees corresponding to northeast. In addition, near the outer edge of a mountain range, rock layers will generally be tilted much less than near the center of the range. Table 1 shows the dips and strikes measured at several points in a square mile of the Allegheny Mountains. So now we have three graphs, and we need to have a rough idea of what these are before we start tackling the questions. It doesn't take long to do, but it's well worth doing, because if you already have some idea of what you, what you can expect to find, it's going to make the questions easier to interpret. So Table 1 um, has a variety of um, locations with varieties of dip and strike. Um, and we did find out that some that uh, the dip is um, greater near the center and less near the edges. So we might say these places with the the lower dip might be further from the center of the mountain range. That's just you know might be true. Uh, it's something we could pay attention to. Then we also have these graphs. Figures one and two show how the average dip and average strike vary at 25 mile intervals along a particular north-south line in the Alleghenies. Um, so we notice that it it uh, starting. It starts going down, then it goes up, then it goes down again in figure one. And figure two is kind of all over the place. Down, up, down, up, down. Um, good to know, and we might be asked about particular points along that graph. So just know that they don't follow necessarily a straight line, that both of them have curves with um, variation. Let's take a look at what some of the questions might be on that very same information, so you get a sense of how much science you really need to know on the ACT science section. How much science did you need to know to answer this one? According to figure one, from north to south, the average dip does what? So north to south on this graph is from left to right. From left to right, the graph goes up and then down and kind of up again, but basically up and then down. The question is asking us what that graph is doing. Does it increase only? No, it goes up then down. Does it decrease only? No, it goes up then down. Decreases then increases? No. Increases, then decreases. That's the closest to what this graph represents. We have an increase and then a decrease. How much science did you need to know for that? Zero. You just had to be able to pay, pay attention to the graph. Now, yes, they're not all this simple, but uh, hopefully this shows you that you can do these even if you're not a science whiz. Let's take a look at another one just to see. So which of, the follow with, uh, which of the following statements is most consistent with the data in figure two? Figure two is this guy. So now, so this is not one where we can make a prediction just based on the graph. Number one, um, the graph is all over the place. Number two, the question wasn't phrased in the form of what we're supposed to do. So basically we need to analyze each answer choice to see whether it's true. One of these is going to be consistent with the information in the graph. Statement A, the strikes vary by approximately six degrees from 41 to 47. So, um, so the strikes, the number of degrees, is the y-axis of this particular graph. Miles are the x-axis. So this is the degrees of strike. Remember that strike is the uh, distance from north. Okay, so the strikes vary by approximately six degrees from 41 to 47. Is that true? Well. The highest point here is short of 48. The lowest point here looks like it's uh, around 41. So 41 to 47, 6 degrees, that sounds about right. We'll keep this guy around. 
um, because maybe he's the right answer. Um, B, the strikes vary by approximately 10 degrees from 40 to 50. Well, it never gets close to 50, so it can't be choice B. Um, the strikes vary by 200 degrees from 0 to 200. Um, no, not even close. This answer is the one that you would choose if you didn't actually just take a moment to look at the, what the x-axis is labeled. Since it's labeled miles, that's not strike. Because strike is in degrees and this is in miles, so don't choose that. Okay, this is one that, um, you know, I guess you might guess if you just weren't even looking. Uh, but 0 to 200 is one of the axes, but it's the wrong one. Uh, and then D, the strikes vary by 200 miles from 0 to 200 miles. Well, so the, D's a little bit more tempting because um, the x-axis does go from 0 to 200, but the strike is on the y-axis, so it's not D either. And it is, in fact, then choice A. So again, not much science, just looking at the graph and not being asleep when you look at it. So chemistry, another one of the topics that you can expect to see on the ACT science section, again, in some combination of um, properties of matter, acids and bases, kinetics and equilibria, um, thermochemistry, organic chemistry, biochemistry, nuclear chemistry. Again, um, even if you've been doing chemistry all throughout high school, you're unlikely to have covered all these things in depth, and most of the time people don't do chemistry all throughout high school. So there's no way you'll know all this stuff already. That's okay. You aren't expected to, you're just expected to maybe have heard of atoms or something and, um, and then pay attention to what the passages tell you because they will give you what you need to know to do well on this section. So again, it's all about what you can do, not what you know. Knowing stuff is just an added bonus. It's icing on the cake. It's gravy, okay? If you know some stuff about the topic, you're going to have an easier time, but you can be just fine without it. So here's a sample chemistry passage. Um, a chemical in blood, hemoglobin, and so here we've just gotten a term defined. Mm -hmm. We find out that hemoglobin, hemoglobin is a chemical in blood, and it binds to oxygen that has entered the lungs and transport the oxygen throughout the body. At an elevation of four miles above sea level, again paying attention to numbers more than words, four miles above sea level is a, is a key element here. Uh, however, a lung full of air will contain only half as much oxygen as at sea level. So four miles up, half as much oxygen half as much oxygen. As a result, most human beings raised near sea level would feel faint if they were to climb a mountain of this height because much less of the hemoglobin in their blood will be carrying oxygen. Figure one shows how the barometric pressure, or also known as air pressure, and the portion of that pressure due to oxygen both drop with altitude. So, um, again, when you see a graph, note general trends, whether they go mostly up, mostly down, up and down and all over the place. Um, knowing helps. So on this one, we see that both of these have a general downward trend. We don't even have to worry that much about which is which at this point until we're asked about it. Um, anyway, altitude and pressure, as altitude increases, pressure decreases. Often, however, individuals from societies that have developed at high altitudes, such as the Andes Mountains, are untroubled by the low oxygen levels because their blood contains much larger amounts of hemoglobin. The individual one data in figure two shows how the oxygen saturation of a normal individual's blood would drop from the normal value of nearly 100% to approximately 50% when the elevation above sea level increases from zero to four miles. So again, there's that four mile um, kind of threshold where they use to go from uh, the 100% to half as much oxygen in the blood. Um, other curves in figure two show that the drop in oxygen saturation is smaller in individuals who come from medium and high altitude societies. So this one, the trend we note is that in all cases, there is a declining trend. As altitude increases, the oxygen saturation also increases, or excuse me, decreases. There's an inverse relationship. However, the dots are all on top of each other at an altitude of zero. When we get all the way to six miles up, the three individuals, um, are, are spread out further on the graph. And these each represent people born um, at different altitudes initially. So there's clearly this correlation between being born at a high altitude and being able to handle high altitudes. That's what we get from the, from the graphs. Uh, let's take a look and see what sort of, uh, well, no, we don't have to go, go too much into it, but um, here's a sample question that you might get based on this one. Again, how much science did you need to know this? Based on figure two, the oxygen saturation of individual two at an altitude of seven miles would be closest to what? Seven miles. Note, the graph only goes up to six. 
So this is what I was talking about before, saying that the lines on graphs can be extended. We have to extrapolate and pretend that these go on. Now we know that there's this downward trend on all of them. So at six miles, um, individual two, individual two is the pink one, okay? At six miles, individual two is at 50%. At seven miles, we would expect it to go down further. He's already, we'll assume it's a he, uh, just because I'm a he, so I'm not trying to be sexist or something. Anyway, um, it's, uh, if he's at 50 at uh, six miles, he's not going to go up to 60 at seven miles, nor is he going to jump to 90 at seven miles, okay? So the trend is downward, it needs to be less than 50. Likewise, um, the trend does not have these guys going down to zero um, oxygen saturation in their blood. It does get worse for them, but it, we would not expect in the space of one mile for this person to go down to zero. Um, at uh, six miles, the guy's at 50. Uh, so at seven miles, we might, might go down to where individual one is, down here, or somewhere in between. And so the only answer that's in between zero and the preposterous going up numbers is 30. How much science did you need to know? In fact, on this one, um, you probably wouldn't have even had to read the passage. So uh, that won't always be the case, but just know that these questions are out there. You should, you should answer every single one of these and get every one of them right. So another example question off that same passage that we took the time to read. According to figure one, the air pressure will equal 100 millimeters um, when the altitude is approximately what? So, um, so we have the pressure in millimeters here. Uh, it will equal 100, that's this, when the altitude is what? So, of course, note that these are all odd numbers in the answer choices and the graph is all even numbers. We also have to care about the air pressure, which is the blue one. So we care about this guy here. Where does it equal 100? Well, it's below 100 at 10. This is 100 right here. It's below 100 at 10 and above 100 at 8. It does not take a rocket surgeon to see that it must be somewhere between the 130 and the 90 or something. Uh, we only have one answer choice. Um, here for when it's at 100, it's got to be between 8 and 10. The only one between 8 and 10 is 9. Answer choice C. So here's a, another question that's less graph based and based more on, on related information and related to the topic that we talked about. So in order to climb high mountains, climbers may use oxygen masks that allow them to breathe pure oxygen. The effect of the ox oxygen mask is equivalent to decreasing the height of the mountain by approximately five miles. Thus, an individual who can climb a mountain three miles high without an oxygen mask will be able to climb a higher mountain while wearing such a mask. If A is the altitude of the highest mountain the individual can climb without oxygen, the altitude of the highest mountain the same individual could climb with oxygen will equal what? Also, again, here we found out that it increases the, or it quote unquote decreases the height of the mountain by five miles. So they can go five additional miles up with an oxygen mask. So a person who could go up three miles could probably go eight miles. That's a tall mountain. So uh, whatever it is the passage is saying, then the highest mountain, if A is the highest you can go without a mask, A plus five is the highest you can go with a, with a mask. Even though it says you subtract five miles from um, the mask is like subtracting five miles. It's like subtracting five miles from the altitude. Climbing an eight-mile eight mountain with a mask feels like climbing a three-mile mountain. A person who can normally climb a three-mile mountain would then be able to climb an eight-mile mountain with an oxygen mask. So the answer choice is D, A plus five. Physics. Um, so again, uh, you may not have done any physics at all at the time when you first take this test, that's okay. The same as the th it's the same as I've been saying the entire time. You don't have to be a science whiz to do this. Uh, you do need to be paying attention. Uh, if you have a background in physics, that will help you. But again, it's not required, so don't worry too much about it. Um, study of objects in motion, how how matter reacts to energy and force, um, how matter moves around when acted upon, you know, things like that. Um, th things that you may run into mechanics. Um, that's the uh, how how things react when forces act upon them. Uh, thermodynamics is the transfer of heat from one thing to another. 
Uh, electromagnetism, unsurprisingly, is about electricity and magnetic fields, hence the name. Fluids are about things that are fluid, things that don't have a solid definite shape, whereas solids are about things that do have a solid definite shape. And then optics are about light um, and the refraction thereof, uh, light and vision and color. Anyway, so uh, these are just, th these. this is the, to use a physics term, an optics term, broad spectrum. To use a broad spectrum of uh, the topics that you could come into contact with on a physics topic, but it could be something else. And you don't need to have this stuff memorized. You just have to be able to read the passage. I know I keep saying that, but I kind of really want you to understand that, that you can do this without doing science. So here's our, our practice passage. A student uses a voltmeter to measure the electrical potential in volts near an electrically charged sphere, and also uses the charges in the potential to calculate the electrical field. The electrical potential and electrical field are expected to depend on either the, dist the distance from the center of the sphere or the square of this distance. If the value of a quantity is proportional to the distance, the value at distance 2a will be twice the value of the quantity at distance a. Alternately, if, the, if, if it is proportional to the square of the distance, the value at distance 2a will be 2 squared equals 4 times the value at distance a. If the value is inversely proportional to the distance or the square of the distance, the, the, the value at distance 2a will be less than the value at distance a by a factor of two or four, respectively, along the same lines as what we just had. That's a little editorial comment. The passage doesn't actually say that. Anyway, figure one shows the electrical potential in volts, abbreviated V, measured every, five, every 50 centimeters from the center of the sphere, and figure two shows the calculated values of the electrical field. Again, we look for trends before we start looking at questions or answers. Uh, here we note a generally declining trend. As the distance from the center of the sphere goes on, the electrical potential drops rapidly at first and then continues to drop, but drops more slowly. Likewise, the electrical field um, per, in, in centimeters of distance also decreases rapidly at first and then slowly as it goes on. So let's see what sorts of questions we might get on this. So as the distance increased from 100 centimeters to 300 centimeters, so we're looking at this range here. And that's also this range here. And you can do this on your passage. I mean, you can actually put the lines in to make sure you, make, you keep these straight. Don't be afraid to mark up your book. It's yours, right? I mean, you don't get to keep it, but, you know, it's yours. Um, as the distance increased from 100 centimeters to 300 centimeters, what happened? Well, it looks like both things go down, so we want an answer choice that says that. A, the electrical potential and electrical field both increased. No, they totally didn't. B, the electrical potential increased and the electrical field decreased. No, they didn't. C, the electrical potential decreased and the electrical field increased. No, they didn't. Which only leaves D, and so if you're sure of your other answers, you don't even have to read it, but since you, if you still have time, you should. It's worth it. You can make sure you got it right. The electrical potential and electrical field both decreased. Yes, they did. They both had a downward trend on the graph. Choice D. Same graphs, new topic, or new question. Based on the information in the passage, electrical potential is what? And so this is what was talked about in the passage, whether things are proportional or proportional to the square or inversely proportional or inver inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So, um, the information. So, basically, we can just use some of the information on the graphs to figure out what the relationship is. So, at um, 50, so 50 is like right here, um, or like 75 or something. Anyway, so um, at 50, it's at 1,000 volts and the um, this one's at 10,000 and even just at 100 the next next point on the graph at 100 this guy's at 500 and um, this guy's down to um, well actually we can just use that one um, because we actually don't need the field. Sorry about that, we only need the electrical potential. So uh, when this guy goes up by two, this guy gets doubled, this guy went one half, which is consistent with the passages talking about if things are um, 
proportional, they'll go up at the same rate. It'll be two times. Um, and if they're inversely proportional, it goes down. To, it'll be it'll go down by half. If it had been proportional to the square of the distance, it would have gone up or down by four. So uh, in this case, we can get rid of the um, We can get rid of the uh, proportional ones because as one goes up, as this guy goes up, this guy goes down. So we can get rid of the proportional ones and all that's left is inversely proportional. The square of the distance, it should have been by a factor of four, so it's not A, uh, leaving only inversely proportional to the distance. So that's the type of thing you can expect to see and that I personally expect you to get right when you take your ACT science. We'll cover the other three passage types next time, of course. Okay, so um, that's about enough of you, Science Lesson 1. Um, your homework, you're very uh, exciting. Well, I don't know. Actually, I think it is pretty exciting. You'll learn a few things. Your homework to practice the skills that we've mentioned today. Um, we covered uh, the biology and physical sciences section um, and the types of uh, passages and, and that you can get and types of topics that, that we would cover there. Then we also covered physical sciences, chemistry, and physics and the types of things that you can expect to see with passages like that. So again, no science knowledge is required. Um, a little bit helps, you know, comfort actually helps more than actual knowledge. So um, being the sort of person or being able to adopt the attitude that seeing some scientific words is not going to upset you or panic you or um, make you cower under a desk. Um, going in with the attitude that, hey, I can handle this, makes a big difference in doing these science passages. So if you can do that, regardless of whatever the topic is, they're going to give you the information you need. You just, able to, you just have to be able to pull it out of the passage. So to practice doing exactly that, do homework, do the homework lessons on each of these topics that we covered, and um, do them before next time so that you can build on what you learned when we talk about the next stuff.